Fantastic. Can you hear me okay? Uh, we can hear you. Yep. Thank you. And can you see my slides? Uh, we can see the slides, or I can. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're good. Yeah. They can. And holler on the chat, um, yeah. and then somebody will interrupt me, I'm sure. Um, thank you so much, Nick. Um, it's nice to be here at uh, GIS Day with you all. Um, I am a longtime GIS Day attendee, having started GIS back with ArcView 3.2, keeping it real. Um, uh, well, my, while my background over the years has been in environmental science GIS and GIS mapping and remote sensing, I've always gravitated toward the applied sciences. Uh, especially around helping nonprofit organizations and uh, communities and governments make data driven decisions uh, grounded in science and to set policy to use that information and those decisions to set policies for people in the planet. And so today I'm going to talk about some of the work that my team is doing with NGO and academic and city partners to do just that to use data and insights and maps to help cities take action on climate change and air pollution. So data insights and maps can be a powerful tool for action, especially environmental action. Um, for over 13 years, I've seen, as, well, I've been at Google for 13 years and during that time I've seen, um, and even before Google, my time at Google, I've seen public benefit groups like nonprofits and civil society organizations, academic researchers um, and governments, agencies use mapping and insights for social and environmental good. And from air quality and solar energy to forest and deforestation, freshwater availability and fishing on the high seas. These are just a few examples of where um, our team has helped nonprofits and scientists and governments have real world impact on the ground or in the ocean um, with mapping technology. For years, I personally have been deeply involved in the field of air quality, working with partners to map air pollution data and insights. And I've learned through that time that more than 90% of our world's population breathe unhealthy air according to the World Health Organization, uh, with more than 4 million premature deaths every single year. Um, and that's not just um, in the most polluted areas, that's in you know, our cities and towns around the world. There's hotspots in, in every city and town around the world. One of the biggest gaps to action is data. There's a huge lack of data and air pollution data worldwide. So our work started several years ago when we started equipping, kind of as an experiment, um, air sensors, air quality sensing equipment on Google Street View cars to measure air pollution. And so, you know, we were already planning on driving Street View to, you know, capture 360 degree images for Google Maps. So we thought, why not also repurpose them or use them also as an environmental sensing platform. And so we started working on air quality projects in California, close to home, so we could calibrate the instruments. And we teamed up with the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, ACLIMA and the University of Texas at Austin to test the science of this idea. And in 2017, th this is what came out of it. This initial work in Oakland, California was published along with the scientific publication in the Journal of Environmental Science and Technology. This study proved that it was possible to use mobile platforms or mobile cars, mobile vehicles to create street by street hyperlocal maps of annual average concentration um, especially when you use that data from repeated drive passes throughout the year. It also showed something really interesting that nobody really expected, and that is that air pollution did vary block by block, sometimes up to five to eight times within a city block. And so whether that's um, known, previously known hotspots, but the variability was unknown, or previously unknown hotspots, um, this kind of hyperlocal data can really tell us a lot. And then our partners at EDF and Environmental Defense Fund worked with Kaiser Permanente. Um, for those people who aren't, may not be local, this is a healthcare and research group um, in, in the Western US um, who analyzed the, the data, the, the, the air quality data, at the hyperlocal air quality data with 40,000 patient records that they had internally. And they found that heart disease was related to the parcel level annual concentration and published the study in environmental health. And so I love this study because it really shows the intersection between air pollution emissions and climate and health impact. And so of course, there's a lot of um, academic work going on um, showing this. And this is one of the projects that showed it that it happens at a hyper local scale as well. But we didn't just measure in Oakland. Um, over a span of four years, we mapped all across um, California, all across the San Francisco Bay Area and in some areas of the Central Valley, um, as well as in the Los Angeles region, 
All in all, we measured 42 million measurements and all of this data is available to, for researchers to use. Um, so if you want access to that data, please copy down that link right there, um, goo.gl forward slash Q for capital T, capital R, lowercase t, lowercase t. That's for people who are listening um, and doing other things at the moment. Um, but this is, just so you know what this is, this is 40 million, 42 million records is one second data collected by scientific or reference grade equipment in the trunk and back seats of the of four street view cars. And it was, they were installed, these equipment was installed, were installed and calibrated by our partners at Aclima. Oh, thank you, Matt. <laughs> um, and they were they're, yeah, installed and cali calibrated by our partners at Aclima. And each of the 42 million records include each pollutant measurement, right? The PM 2.5, the NO2, NO, CO, CO2, and ozone. Um, and more information can be found at that at that medium blog there too, which I'm happy to provide a link in the in the chat later. Um, so over those several years, um, we've shared this data with over 200 scientists who have published and over seven peer reviewed scientific papers have come out that we know of, we may not know of all of them. Um, and we, we really want to support those scientific works um, because we want, of course, these insights to be grounded in science. And we carry out this work with one goal to make these insights available to cities and other organizations so that they can make decisions toward healthier and more sustainable cities. Um, for their city. Uh, I mentioned that we, you know, we, or I should say, after the, I mentioned that, 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 that those first four years were proving out the science and proving out the application and the applied science of, of the project. Um, we then went a little bit further and we, in 2018, we began our partnerships with a few European cities uh, where we, we had deep engagements, including London through the Breathe London project. Uh, and uh, as well as with the city of Copenhagen and Utrecht University. And both of these were to measure hyperlocal air quality to build an annual average street by street map uh, to use in combination with the other data, the other air quality data that the cities were already using for their air quality work and climate work. Um, we've seen hyperlocal air pollution measurements be very helpful and actionable for cities like Copenhagen because uh, for a couple of reasons, and I listed four here that I think are the most important. Number one is, if you have hyperlocal air pollution data, you can start focusing on hotspots. You know which areas to start with and prioritize and size some of your interventions. Number two, you know, meanwhile, while those policies are taking effect, because policy does take time, not only to set, but also to, to see the impact of, Meanwhile, the cities can then reduce exposure to the vulnerable populations. So we've actually, um, I'll talk about this next, but we've actually seen um, the city of Copenhagen start to think about how can they um, redesign their neighborhoods or any new neighborhoods, how can they design them um, thinking, of, thinking today about tomorrow, especially to those most vulnerable populations like children, et cetera. Uh, number three, cities can track their progress over time. And that's why we're focused right now on annual because we think that if, you, if we can build an annual map every, every year, cities can then track progress um, at that time scale and, and, and adapt. Uh, cities can, number four, cities can bring their residents along with them. And I love this, this point because I think it's, it's often understated, which is you know, to, make, to take climate action and to improve our air, it's going to be a collective, it's going to take collective action, not just by our, our city leaders and, and you know, community groups that are, that are always fighting for these kinds of things, but by all of us, it's gonna take me not driving down to my city center, but biking down to it. And so sometimes that may be difficult. If we're all on the same page with the same data, it's a little bit easier. It, it levels the playing field um, and, and we can be on the same page and thinking and acting towards a common goal. I mentioned a little bit that the city of Copenhagen had, had started using this data um, already to take action. And so they, they, they're doing this by teaming up with Gale Architects, one of the um, uh, uh, popular architecture firms in Copenhagen to use the data to design the next generation of healthy neighborhoods in Copenhagen. And they're calling this the Thrive Zones. And basically these are neighborhoods designed to allow young children to thrive, children zero to five, um, they think about if they're gonna design their neighborhoods for the next generation, they need to start thinking about the kids that are under five today and getting them to make sure that they're breathing air. Where can they help them avoid hot, hot spots and where can they invite them to low spots or to areas where the air is cleaner? And so they're, plan, they're using this to plan um, the next few decades of development. Five uh, minutes. 
until yep. Q&A. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Um, such as where to place new schools and playgrounds. And so all of this, of course, with the goal towards healthier and sustainable cities. And these air quality insights can be really helpful for climate action, like I said, and we're hoping that um, these will become a useful part of this tool that I just want to briefly touch on. Um, this presentation is mostly about air quality, which I have fascination with, um, but we're really, we know that this air quality data could be useful for climate action. And so we hope it becomes a part of this free tool that we've built called Environmental Insights Explorer, which is like a city dashboard to help cities make decisions and take climate action. And this tool helps them measure building emissions, transportation emissions, identify reduction opportunities like rooftop solar, and then also identify air pollution reduction opportunities. And so here's a little closer look at what this tool does. Um, there's, you know, you can zoom in to different cities and see building and transportation emissions by mode, how many cars uh, trips are there every year, aggregated to an entire city for an entire year so that cities can then track year over year. Today, this kind of data is available for 3,000 3, cities worldwide to help them take action. And you can also start and see some examples of how we started to use this air pollution data in this tool. I mean, one thing just to pause, I wanna say is that like air pollution and climate action or air pollution and climate change, they share some of the same sources, right? Emission sources, but they also share some of the same solutions. So the, 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 the city leaders that are making, taking climate action should also feel the benefits of you know, healthier air. The cities that are taking benefit or taking action on, on polluted air well, should also see climate, um, um, climate benefits. And so we really wanna compare these together and let cities use both of these data sets together. And then just this past month, we partnered with LA Mayor Garcetti's office to launch the Tree Canopy Lab in Environmental Insights Explorer. And this tool, if you zoom in and, and you start exploring it, it combines Google Earth Engine's data analysis and AI and aerial imagery to help Los Angeles urban foresters see where there are gaps in their tree coverage and identify more tree planting projects. So I'm really glad I could end my talk on a Los Angeles map. Um, and with that, I will say thank you and pass it back to our hosts. Great, Karen, thank you very much. It's great. We put that last uh, link, by the way, the insights.sustainability.google. We put that in the chat as well for people to take a look at. It's very interesting stuff. Um, I love Hyperlocal. Um, it's so interesting, it's so fascinating. And actually that's the Q&A. So one of the questions came in said, what kind of scale or resolution counts as Hyperlocal? Well, that's a good question. I mean, when we think about it for air quality, we're thinking about it a hundred meters or lower. Um, and uh, that's that's not defined anywhere. It's just how we define it. But it could mean something different if you're thinking a global scale, right? Uh, and you're thinking maybe 30 meters or, um, sorry, not 30, a kilometer for the entire globe is pretty good for the entire globe. But when you start zooming into cities, it needs to get more granular than that. So we're, we're I define it, let me say that. I define it as a uh, hundred meters or better. And sometimes it, it, we can get better. Great, thank you. Okay, here's another question that came in. Uh, this is from Tom uh, Lafferty. It says, good to see you. Have you been working with the California Air Quality Board EnviroScore team? Uh, no, not yet, if anyways. Um, do you mean the EnviroScreen? Let me open up the chat here. It might be in the Q&A, it says okay. EnviroScore, but I think that's probably it. Yeah, um, we haven't, although, you know, we've talked to a lots of cities and um, the cities that we've spoken to in California, um, as I'm sure every people who are in this field know, um, in, in, the, in the environmental justice and environmental science field, uh, especially for cities and counties um, in California, the Enviro screen um, data is extremely important and extremely valuable to cities and government leaders. And so we are thinking about how we can provide that because pr provide that or at least um, include it as part of the data visualization because, um, and, and not just for California, but other kinds of demographic information and environmental justice information and, and other population information for other cities around the world as well. So. Um, Okay, uh, this came in. Uh, what's the temporal resolution frequency of the street view air quality data? So, um, you know, when the car drives down the street, it's collecting a sample every second. Um, but that data is just a snapshot of that location at that second. And so how do you then translate that to an annual map, which is the temporal resolution that we are 
focused on, I guess, or that that is our goal at the end of the drive, right? You need a lot of different drive passes. If, if you're going to use modeling, which is one, one, one option, you could model what it's going to be like for the whole year. But the, all the maps I showed you today are not modeling, actually. They are um, a data aggregation or statistical um, computation of many, many, many different drive passes throughout the year. And we did this because we wanted to um, um, experiment. In some cases, we drove certain roads in Oakland, for example, that was our first kind of focus area and pilot study, 100 times or 200 times, like there's, there was a lot of driving going on so that we can understand, we overdrove so that we could then back up and say, how many times do you have to drive? And they found that, you know, sometime, somewhere between five to 10 or plus times, um, depending on the area or the pollutant, um, that you need, you would need to that's how many passes you would need in order to be able to have a robust annual concentration estimate, uh, average concentration estimate. So I don't know if that's super helpful or, or answering the question, but um, yeah, maybe clarify right. if I didn't answer it. Yeah, no, I think that's and, great. And no should, problem. Yeah, I should say that the academic journals that I cited on the slides, and I can ping them here too, if you'd like, are go into the methodology in huge detail. Great. No problem. Thank you. Okay. This one came in uh, to the chat to us. It says air quality is often considered a social justice issue. Is there an ability within the tool to compare air quality data with impoverished areas, race and census data? Not yet, but that, go, that back, goes back to the question about the Enviroscreen is that we know that, they're, that overlaying these kinds of um, uh, sensitive, vulnerable populations, socioeconomic data, um, um, where children are, where elderly, like where these different places are that where, where vulnerable populations may hang out, um, all of that is very important. And so we're taking it in and trying to figure out a way to give cities that, that power. Got it. Okay. And looks like we have time for one more question. Uh, it says, uh, always been interested in air quality during bumper to bumper traffic on freeways that have sound barrier walls. Has this type, has this project collected some data in these areas? Yeah, the answer is yes, we have, but we have not anal analyzed that. Um, that is something that uh, would be a great scientific study. And so you could apply that data, get the data and, and, and undergo, <laughs> carry that out. Um, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating study or question. And I think that there have been studies about that in the past, looking at both vegetative walls as well as cement walls and how, the, how they let the air pollution rise before it gets and, and mix before it gets down before so it doesn't just go right into the neighborhoods nearby um so yeah there's there's a lot of scientific questions around that but we haven't tackled that yet okay actually you know it looks like we do actually have one more minute so we're going to get one more because a couple more did come in um let me get this one as this will be our last are there are there other possibilities of google coordinating with governments groups to collect hyper local data through the street view vehicles you mean non-air pollution data? Uh, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, let me just put it out there well, here. That's well, I can say one question we've heard before, which I'm very excited about, is um, just uh, uh, measuring hyperlocal temperature to understand urban heat island. Um, you know, there are some great for urban heat island remotely sense derived um, data sets, but um, how can we potentially either map or model even a more hyperlocal um, using satellites and ground data, hyperlocal ground data combined. So that's something that, again, I'm not doing, we're not doing at the moment, but um, you know, the, the scientific possibilities are endless. Great, thank you. So there was a couple more questions. We'll get those to you after. We'll get them answered by everybody, but I think for the sake of time, this was a five minute shorter session because of where we're ending at the end of the day, but really appreciate your time, Karen. Thank oh, you for thank being you. with us. Um, thank you, everybody, as well. So thank you, Karen. You have a great day. Everybody that stays on, yeah, we're going to start at 2.25 with our next session. So we'll still take about three or four minutes uh, as